if you're looking for that. If you didn't bring a copy of Scripture, you can turn in the Pew Bible to page 676 in the Old Testament. And we're going to look at this passage tonight as we're continuing on on Sunday and Wednesdays, getting ready for our revival here in less than three weeks. We want to be ready, okay? And what this passage talks about, it's the prepared worshiper gives God glory, okay? The prepared worshiper gives God glory. Uh, I want to make sure, um, and I, I want to share this story with you. I had a lady call me the other day, and let me preface this by saying, I asked her if I could share this story, but not her name. And she says, that's totally fine, okay? If she'd have said no, I wouldn't have shared this. But she called me, and she says, Jimmy, I'm, and now this is a very, very active person in our church. Anytime I need anything, I can pick up the phone and call this person, and she will do anything to help our church. And if she sees something that needs to be done, she jumps right in and does it without anybody asking her. And she said, I feel really empty inside. I need to confess to you. And she says, I'm just, I feel like I'm going through the motions right now. And she goes, you know, I'm there at church every chance I can, but I feel like I'm living this lifeless religion right now. I've been a Christian for many years, but it just, something's missing. I'm tired of doing stuff around the church because it just it doesn't fulfill me like it used to. And she's really having this struggle right now in her life. And she says, what do I need to do? And I said, let me tell you something. We all go through seasons. Up here, I can do that too. Some of us are better at hiding from others than uh, you really know. But we all go through dry seasons. We don't give up. We keep searching the Lord. We keep staying close to him because in here, when we come and we worship in the right way, when we push everything out from out there, God will revive us. He does miraculous things in our heart, and he will take somebody who is dead spiritually, and he will make them alive. He will re bring back your joy, restore your salvation, the joy of your salvation. It will happen. But there's periods of times that all of us are going to go through in seasons when we're just not going to feel like worshiping. We're going to feel like it's a real burden to worship and to do our quiet times and things like that. And when we're pushing away from the Lord in those quiet times, that's when we need, the, need it the most because we have gone bone dry. And especially for you, and I, I, I use this sermon tonight because this is the group that does 99% of the work in the church that's sitting in here tonight. So you know this feeling. You know what it is to be giving everything you have and to go dry because you're asked to, to do so many things. When this happens, go back and, and meditate on the things that you were doing when you remember the happiness and the joy in your life because somewhere along the line you've pulled back on some of those things. You've gotten too busy in other areas. Some things replace something or you've been hurt. Sometimes we just get hurt when we get hurt, either by others or, you know, by ourselves, things like that. We do something silly, we, we push away from God, and that's why we go dry. He's the source. He's the living water. Well, the Jews in Jerusalem at this time, Malachi's writing, they were going through the motions of temple worship. They had just come back, come back from being deported out, from being in exile, and when they get back... Uh, God raises up the last Old Testament prophet named Malachi. Now, let me tell you how important this message is in the book of Malachi. It's just three chapters. You can read through it pretty quick. But it's so important that after God speaks to Israel, there's 400 years of silence till John the Baptist. So what was God so upset with the Israelites? And we're just like them. <laughs> if we were in the garden, we'd have picked the fruit. If we were in the wilderness, we would have disobeyed. We'd have been out there with the golden calf. There's nothing that happened in those times that we wouldn't have been doing. We got ancestors. They were doing it. We would have done it, okay? Those things still come into play. But the Jews, as they come back, I'm sure some of them have thought that God had forsaken them because they went into exile. And they come back, and, and they're just, yeah, they've got the temple rebuilt. They're going through the sacrifices and things like that. But their hearts aren't in it. And sometimes when we come in this, this place, our hearts are far away from the Lord, to be truthful. We sit in here and we're just kind of in a blank stare. This morning it was good to see God using that music just to stir hearts. 
You know, we got to do something different from time to time. And I love what Jamie said before the service. He goes, that wasn't a conf- uh, concert. That was a worship service is what they did this hope this morning. So I hope you enjoyed that. But this man Malachi, God's last prophet of the Old Testament, he's a little mysterious. His name means my messenger. He's a clear-cut guy who was probably strongly opposed, but he was opposed to anyone who treated the temple and the worship services with discontent. And mainly God's message first was to those who should know better, which was the priest, those responsible for being up here, that there's a, there's a higher level of accountability for those that God puts in place of leadership to make sure that everybody's heart keeps being stirred for him. And he wanted to restore genuine worship back to the temple, okay? Because externally, when you went to the temple, it probably looked like everything was going good. You heard the animals, you know, making noises as they were being slaughtered by the priest. The priest was wearing their same garments. People probably, as they passed each other in the temple, says, it's great to be in the house of the Lord. But inside, there was a cancer that was killing them. Externally, they looked good. Inside, they were dead. So God's final spokesman comes up prior to John the Baptist and he gives this message and we're just going to kind of work through this this uh, tonight okay so bear with me because I'm kind of all over the place as we start let me pray over this as we get going Uh, father as we open your word tonight there's many of us if we were honest with you right now we are bone dry inside we are struggling to keep our faith going and we know that You can revive us. I pray for those in this room right now that have just hit a dry spot. That tonight would be a night that you would wet that dry ground. And that you would restore their joy back to them. It's in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. All right, let me tell you something a little different about the book of Malachi compared to the other prophetic books. Uh, This book has what they call a discourse where the other ones are just basically a... A discourse. Let me back up. The other prophetic books are basically a discourse. The prophet comes in, he tells him what God has said. Okay? In this one, the prophet comes in, he tells him what God says, the people respond back, and then God responds back. There's seven cycles of question answers through this book where God speaks and says something, and the people make smart eloquent remarks back to God. And he answers back to him on this. So the very first thing he tells him in verse two is that he loves him. He says, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau, and I have made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. God is saying, number one, I love you. In a tender, affectionate, compassionate love, he's telling Israel, even though you've you've been disobedient, And I've had to discipline the the Esau descendants, which were Edom, to complete desolation. I chose you, Israel. You are the remnant that I love and that I am bringing back to do great things and to bless you. Do you sense right now, not the church Sunday school answer, but do you have peace in your heart right now knowing God loves you? Unwavering peace knowledge you need to have that nailed down he loves you so much he doesn't want you to go through things and not feel that he's not there for you because he is we're not promised rose gardens but we are promised that he will always be with us got chapter one here god tells the people there what he wants from them he gives them an antidote for going through the motions of worship here and this is what god expects The very first thing is he expects the greatest reverence we can give him. Okay? Now, that's not outwardly. That's inwardly. Right here from your heart. Let's look at verse 6 and see what it says here. He says, talking about the sin of the priest, he says, A son honors his father and a servant his master. Then if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my respect? Says the Lord of hosts. To you, O priest, who despise my name, but you say how have we despised your name all right let's start with that little word in verse six honor what does it mean to honor somebody this is a beautiful hebrew word and what it means it literally means to be heavy 
So when you're honoring somebody, they're a heavyweight in your life, okay? They're important in your life. They're above others. And you throw weight towards them, which means you throw importance their way. You know, in the Ten Commandments, he says, honor your father and mother. That doesn't mean just obey and respect them. It means to act that they're truly significant in your life. That's what that word honor means. So he says, when you come to worship me, whether it's in your prayer closet, in your car, on your porch, under the shade tree, or when you come in here, he says, I want honor. I want you to throw weight at me. I want you to give me all of this, not partial. I want it all. I want your sincere heart. I want reverence. You know how to be reverent towards God, don't you? We forget sometimes whose church this is. It's his, okay? And we come in here and we, we act like it's our house and, and if we don't like the things the way they're going, then we get upset and we want to do this. But we forget it's his house. So we come in here with reverence, not wanting to offend him. And the way we offend him is when we offend each other. And when we offend each other, we offend him. It works, you know, both ways. So the word honor there means to throw something heavy, to throw full obligation, full heart towards him. God says, I am your father, I am your master, I expect honor, I expect reverence. Don't treat me with contempt. How do we treat him with contempt? It's an attitude more than anything. It's, it's coming in here with other things on our mind. We've got a special time here, and you, got special, you can worship anywhere because your body's the temple. You can worship God anywhere, but he's saying, I want you. I want all your heart when you're coming to me. I don't want you reading your Bible and then checking your phone over here or thinking, making a list in the side of your Bible of things maybe you need to do later on. That's not giving me honor. That's giving me lip service. He wants a heartfelt attitude of respect and honor towards him and an attitude that recognizes who he is and how gracious he's been to us. You know, there's a, a story I was reading about Henry Ward Beecher, who was, some of you may know was a very famous preacher at one time, and he didn't disclose when he was out of the pulpit for obvious reasons. And he, this young man was filling in for him one day, and as he goes to get up in the pulpit, people realize that that pastor that's usually there isn't there, that they've got a substitute. So people start getting up and leaving. And this young preacher says, all those, he says, excuse me, can I have your attention? All those that came to worship Henry Ward Beecher, you're dismissed. All those that are here to worship the Lord, please stay. And be seated. Because he's here. Can you imagine that? What are some reasons people go to church? Come to church. There's some uh, superficial reasons I see. You know. Some want to hear a certain preacher. Some want to watch their children perform. Which are these, When I say these things. They're not all bad. But the number one thing is our reason is for God here, okay? We have the children's programs and things like that to draw parents in, so hopefully they'll get saved and want to come to church. Those are important, but the number one goal is not to hear a certain preacher, not to see the children perform, not to visit with friends, not to feel like I'm fulfilling an obligation, I'm checking this box off this week, or to enhance my business opportunities, or to see what others are wearing. I always hear that. Look at those cute shoes. Every week she looks so nice in this hat. And we talk about that. I just can't, in this one, she's so sweet. She goes, I just can't wait to see her every week. She just dresses so neat. That's almost sounded like the reason she comes to church to check out this girl's clothing to see what she's going to wear. The only acceptable reason is to come in here and give God glory and honor. Okay? Worship is not entertainment. It's not meant to come in here and manipulate your minds and hearts to make a decision. Or it's not here to indoctrinate you into something. It's for you to meet with God corporately because he does something incredible when we all come together in one spirit and one truth. What's something else God expects? He expects the best response we can give. Look at verse, the second part of verse 6. And then we'll read through verse 8. This is what they say. This is the priest replying. 
How have we despised your name? You are presenting, this is what the Lord through Malachi says, you are presenting, presenting defiled food upon my altar, but you say, how have we defiled you? And that you say, the table of the Lord is to be despised, but when you present the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you present the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Why not offer to it your governor? Would he be pleased with it? Or would he receive you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? So now he gets into the sacrifices that they bring to the temple. And if you remember at this time, the sacrifices that they brought, the Lord gave very specific directions in the Old Testament law that they were to pick the best out of their herds and their flocks to bring the first fruits of those things to bring to sacrifice. And what the people were doing and the priests were allowing is the people said, well, here's an old blind goat. I'm not going to get anything for him if I sell him, so I might as well t- they're just going to kill him down there at the church. So I might as well just take him and let him out, and I'll keep the best to myself. The gatekeepers, the priests, they weren't only allowing something that wasn't second best, but it was worse than that. And God says, you've despised my house. You've brought contempt on my house. You know the the commands. Why does God want the the lambs and the the flocks and the herds at that time? Was it because he needed that? I mean, are they feeding God when they come and deliver those things? What is the true meaning behind the sacrifice for the Lord? Love. It's showing that if he asks something of me, I'm going to go above and beyond. Inside of us, we're all, we fight the flesh. Because the flesh says, you don't really need to give that. They might do something, you know, you could really use this. You know, you got this vacation coming up, and if you put just so much aside, you can really do these things. The flesh does these things, and God is saying, honor me, and you won't believe how I'll open up the windows of heaven to you. If you'll... Just honor me with your heart and your actions. You won't miss that at all. I promise you. But I want to see if I'm that important to you. Okay? I want to see if you love me that much. Because if you do, you're going to see a whole different side of me that you haven't seen. You know, people that have that part settled in their lives, that they take care of God's stuff first, you know the blessing of it. You know how he stretched things and how he's done things. Now, since we no longer offer animal sacrifices, what does God want from us as a sacrifice? Because of Christ. Christ was the once and for all sacrifice. And because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, saving us, giving us eternal life, forgiveness, all those great things that come under the the veil of salvation, what do we give back to God as an offering, as a sacrifice? What does he say? Does he want your gifts at the altar? Or does he want this still? It's always been about the heart for him. It's always been about him wanting you. He chose you. Okay? You don't take somebody to the dance. I hope you never have done this, taking somebody to a dance prior to becoming a Baptist because we can't dance. And you don't dance with that person, but you choose somebody else. You don't do that. God says, I chose you. I, I saved you and I brought you and I'm going to protect you. Choose me always over anything else in your life. You know, the Bible shows us that uh, there's three standards for sacrifices. Have you ever had a coach or a teacher, (laughs) several teachers, say, when I turn in some piece of work, they say, Jimmy, you can do better than that. You ever heard those words? Maybe it's your mom or your dad you remember. My dad, whenever we would, you know, he was first training me how to mow the yard at age three with the mower and the weed eater. My mom, he would just say, stay inside. It's okay. I got this under control. And he was showing me, and he tricked me. He says, you know, you're too young to mow right now. You know, one of these days you'll be a man and you'll get to mow this yard, but you can't do it right now. And Boy, that just made me want to do it even more. And then when I get out there and mow, he says, Jimmy, you did a great job today. But you missed some spots here. You know, when your mom comes outside, she's going to want to see that curb nice and clean from the edger. Would you mind going back and doing that over? And he was always worked that, you know. So every time I wanted to mow, 
I knew I needed to do something, or I was, he was going to come back out there, not hatefully, but he would just say, hey, look right here. You know, we, we missed the weed eating under this bush here. Would you, would you get that? Because I, I want it to look nice each week. I now know what he was doing. I did not then. So what does the Bible tell us are three standards for our sacrifices that we give? Number one, we're to give our best. To give our best. Um, I was reading a story in one of the magazines that somebody has been providing me about this missionary that's family was overseas, and they ordered a box of clothes. This church was selling clothes. They, they had, that was part of their ministry at their churches. They would gather clothes, and they would sell them overseas very cheap so that people could have them that are on missions and stuff like that, and they could either use them or give them back. And he wanted to help this church. The church was going to help him. And he says, my parents and me ordered this great shipment. It says it was $100 of clothes. And he says, when we open up the box, all the zippers are gone on the pants and all the buttons are gone on the shirt. They'd taken all those off. And they'd sent those clothes to him. And he says, you know, we, we looked at the box. And we said, this shipment is worthless. It's absolutely worthless. How often does God feel that same way about us? That our, our, our gift to him is missing something. That it's coming up short. That we haven't put our very best into it. The second aspect of giving is to give God first. To give God first. A pastor friend of mine who just moved to Texas, um, from Florida to Texas, and they were doing a pounding for him at his house. And if you or don't understand what a pounding is, it's the church provides some groceries and things like that, toilet paper, all that stuff. And in the parsonage, they had put some furniture for them. They said, we've got, we got some furniture we want to give you. And we're, we're going to set this place up, and we're going to fill the refrigerator up, and we're going to fill the freezer up, and we're going to fill the pantry up with canned goods. You're going to be set for six months. And he's thinking, man, this is really nice, because I'm moving my family a long way from Florida to Texas, and this is such a great sign of a giving church and a loving church. And he says he goes in there, and the TV in the, in the corner over there is one in a wood box. Now, we know those TVs, how old they are. It's got rabbit ears sitting up on top. The couch has got a couple of holes in them. He says he goes to the refrigerator, and he's looking at things, and he's thinking, this is really awesome because the whole refrigerator's packed, everything else, and the pantry's just packed. And as they start going through things, he said over half the produce was old. He says the canned goods had rust on them that people had just basically cleaned out their pantries to take it to the house. He said a lot of the expiration dates were way past, years past. And he says, but the majority of the stuff, he says, was really good and really nice. So he goes, I, I had me and my wife sitting there on the floor and we're thinking, what did we just move to? What's, what's wrong with these Texans? And he says, you know, we've got two feelings kind of at the same time. Great joy at the blessings that they were giving us, you know, setting up the house, cleaning the house, and in great sadness that some people didn't care enough, but they just, you know, stuff that should have gone to the garbage or garage sale ended up in the house. And he says, I was sitting here thinking, what kind of church is this? What kind of worship are they going to give God when that's what they give man? Are they going to give God their best, or are they always going to be giving leftovers to them? The third aspect of giving is you've got to give what costs you. Okay, It's different for each person. Some things cost others more than others. Giving should be sacrificial. You remember the story in 2 Samuel 24 where David is wanting to buy the threshing floor to make an altar to worship the Lord. And the man offered to give him the oxen and everything else free. And David says, I can't accept that. I can't offer something to God that costs me nothing. I want you to think about those last couple words, that cost me nothing. What does your sacrificial giving of the Lord cost you? What does it mean to give less than your best? What does it look like to give God the last of what's left over? What does it mean to give him gifts that cost us nothing? 
I'll give you some real examples of what that looks like. I'll wake up in the morning knowing it's time for devotion time, but Sportsman's Guide has sent me 30 emails overnight, and they're having all kinds of sales. And now Big Sky Tool that Mark told me about, and all these other little neat websites, these ammo websites and everything else have sent me all these emails and, you know, I can do the devotion in a minute, but I end up spending an hour and a half going through all these emails looking at all the deals. And then I flip over to my Bible app and I run through it in about five minutes and I walk out the door because I'm busy. That's what giving less than your best looks like. Offering God leftovers. When our best energy and our talents and our best motivation go to something other than his kingdom, that's what it looks like when you give him leftovers. When I have a choice to either sit on the sideline or find a place in the church to serve that really doesn't require a lot of me, that's not giving God our best. You know, we, we beg and beg people, help us in the children's department. And they're saying, are you kidding me? I've raised my kids. Those kids will drive you crazy. Yes. That's the hardest place to serve in the church. But it's the most rewarding and most needed. When it comes to giving God an offering, you know, I have people come up to me and they say, you, you know, I don't tithe. I said, no, I don't know that. That's between you and God. I don't look at that stuff. And then I'll see them with something else that they purchased where they made a decision, this is my God, not him. You know, when I watch a, a show, or if yesterday was a big football day, how many of y'all were hoop, Tennessee fans here? Hooping and hollering, right? Got excited. That game winning touchdown at the end. How much, are, how much of that kind of passion have you put into worship? Do you give God the same glory that you gave whoever your team is? That's a tough one for all of us, isn't it? Because we can get caught up in those things. But Ben and I were talking, and Kyle Alderman says that some of the greatest temples that we have right now, we're talking about the Baal Temple that's been built in New York right now, and Kyle Alderman says some of the greatest temples we have right now are our college football stadiums because we go there to worship. We give that team our worship and our praise. And we come in here sometimes and we cross our arms and we say, I wish this guy would hurry up with this sermon. He's lost me. How many songs are we going to sing? Are we going to sing those, those chorus songs over and over again? We're not giving him our best. Okay? We're putting him in a box and we're putting other things as our God. Some people see God as a kind of a grandfather. He winks at our sins. When we give some cheap offering, he says, that's okay, son. I thank you for that. But when you read through this book, Let's look at verses 9 and 10 here. This is how he responds to such an attitude. Verses 9 and 10. He says, But now will you not entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us with such an offering on your part? Will he receive any of you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? Let's keep reading. Oh, that um, there were one among you who would shut the gates that you might not uh, usefully kindle the fire of my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts nor will I accept the offering from you. There's a very distinct message about treating God like a buddy without reverence. He says, would somebody shut the doors and blow out the fire? I hope he never says that about us as a church on Sunday. Jimmy, you and everybody else just leave because this ain't giving me any glory today. Everybody's come in here with their own agenda, own thing, something else on their mind. Y'all just shut the door and go home. I'm not there. We need to give him the highest regard. He talks about his name. I want you to see how many times he says my name in verses 11 and 14. Let's read those. He says, For from the rising of the sun even to the setting, my name will be great among the nations and in every place incense going to be offered to my name and a grain offering that is pure for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Now skip down to verse 14. He says, But cursed be the swindler who has a male in the flock and vows it that sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name 
is to be feared among the nations. What's the purpose of my name? When God says, Moses, you go tell him I am, said, he's talking now. He's the one telling them. That embodies all he is, his character, his person, his very nature. And when he says, my name, that's exactly what he's talking about. He says, his person, his character, his very nature. Why will his name be great? When you take that word, he says, he is a great king, the Lord Almighty. 23 times in the book of Malachi, he calls himself this three-word title, the Lord Almighty. Translated some as the host, the Lord of hosts. You know what that means? What he's saying is I have the whole army of heaven ready to do my work because of who I am. All of heaven will succumb and do exactly as I ask. The warmest response here, how tiresome it is, verse 13. The Jewish people became bored in their worship. And this is their answer to them. How tiresome it's become. The Jews in their worship do like we do sometimes. It's become a ritual. It's become going through the motions. It's mechanical. It's familiar. And when we get familiar at things, we don't do the right thing sometimes. We take for granted. And he's saying, because of my name, when you come in here, remember who I am. Because if you're not giving me glory and honor, then you've forgotten who I am. And that's not right. And I close with this. In verse 9, I want to go back to this verse. He says, but now, will you not entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us with such an offering on your part? Will he receive any of you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? You know, when we worship correctly, we get a benefit. When we give him glory and honor, we get a benefit. He works in our lives in miraculous ways. We benefit that because we have peace, we have comfort, and we get to see a different side of God we haven't seen before sometimes. He unveils himself. He shows, he starts peeling back the onion layers and he shows us as you draw near to him, he's going to show you and reveal more of himself to you. But when we come in here passively, we miss out. We miss out. And I don't want you to miss out. And I don't want to miss out. So as we get ready for our revival, prepared hearts each and every day, drawing closer, throwing more coal on that fire, trying to get that thing hot again sometimes. If it's gone out, put more coal on that fire.